Before the rule of Tiber Septim, all of Tamriel was in chaos. The poet Trachesis called that period of continuous unrest the days and nights of blood and venom. The kings were a petty lot of grasping tyrants who fought Tiber's attempts to bring order to the land, but they were as disorganized as they were dissolute, and the strong hand of Septim brought peace forcibly to Tamriel. The year was the Second Era, 896. The following year, the Emperor declared the beginning of a new era, and thus the Third Era, Year Ought. For 38 years, the Emperor Tiber reigned supreme. It was a lawful, pious, and glorious age when justice was known to one and all, from serf to sovereign. On Tiber's death, it reigned for an entire fortnight as if the land of Tamriel itself was weeping. The Emperor's grandson, Pelagius, came to the throne. Though his reign was short, he was as strong and resolute as his father had been, and Tamriel could have enjoyed a continuation of the Golden Age. Alas, an unknown enemy of the Septim family hired that accursed organization of cutthroats, the Dark Brotherhood, to kill the Emperor Pelagius I as he knelt at prayer at the Temple of the One in the Imperial City. Pelagius I's reign lasted less than three years. Pelagius had no living children, and so the crown imperial passed to his first cousin, the daughter of Tiber's brother, Agnorith Kintria, former queen of Sylvanar, assumed the throne of Kintria I. Her reign was blessed with prosperity and good harvest, and she herself was an avid patroness of the arts, music, and dance. Kintria's son was crowned after her death, the first emperor of Tamriel to use the imperial name Uriel. Uriel I was the great lawmaker of the Septim dynasty and a promoter of independent organizations and guilds. Under his kind but firm hand, the Fighters Guild and the Mages Guild increased in prominence throughout Tamriel. His son and successor, Uriel II, reigned for 18 years from the death of Uriel I in the Third Era, 64, to Pelagius II's ascension in the Third Era, 82. Tragically, the rule of Uriel II was cursed with blights, plagues, and insurrections. The tenderness he inherited from his father did not serve Tamriel well, and little justice was done. Pelagius II inherited not only the throne from his father, but also the debt from the latter's poor financial and judicial management. Pelagius dismissed all of the Elder Council and allowed only those willing to pay great sums to resume their seat. He encouraged similar acts among his vassals, the kings of Tamriel, and by the end of his 17-year reign, Tamriel had returned to prosperity. His critics, however, have suggested that any advisor possessed of wisdom, but not of gold, had been summarily ousted by Pelagius. This may have led to some of the troubles his son Antiochus faced, when he in turn became emperor. Antiochus was certainly one of the more flamboyant members of the usually austere Septim family. He had numerous mistresses, and nearly as many wives and was renowned for the grandeur of his dress and his high good humor. Unfortunately, his reign was rife with civil war, surpassing even that of his grandfather, Uriel II. The War of the Isle in the Third Era 110, twelve years after Antiochus had assumed the throne, nearly took the province of Somerset Isle away from Tamriel. The united allegiance of the kings of Somerset and Antiochus only managed to defeat Orgum of the island kingdom of Pyodonia due to a freak storm. Legend credits the Sigic Order of the Isle of Arteum with the sorcery behind the Tempest. The story of Kentria II, heiress to her father Antiochus's throne, is certainly one of the saddest tales in imperial history. Her first cousin, Uriel, 
son of Queen Potima of Solitude, accused Kintraya of being a bastard, alluding to the infamous decadence of the imperial city during her father's reign. When this accusation failed to stop her coronation, Uriel bought the support of several disgruntled kings of High Rock, Skyrim, and Morrowind, and, with Queen Potima's assistance, he coordinated three attacks on the Septim Empire. The first attack occurred in the Iliac Bay region, which separates High Rock and Hammerfell. Kintraya's entourage was massacred, and the Empress taken captive. For two years, Kintraya II languished in an imperial prison, believed to be somewhere in Glenpoint or in Glenmoral, before she was slain in her cell under mysterious circumstances. The second attack was on a series of imperial garrisons along the coastal Morrowind Islands. The Empress's consort, Kantan Erinx, fell defending the forts. The third and final attack was a siege of the Imperial City itself, occurring after the Elder Council had split up the army to attack Western High Rock and Eastern Morrowind. The weakened government had little defense against Uriel's determined aggression, and capitulated after only a fortnight of resistance. Uriel took the throne that same evening and proclaimed himself Uriel III, Emperor of Tamriel. The year was the Third Era 121, and thus began the War of the Red Diamond described in Volume 2 of this series. Volume 1 of this series described, in brief, the lives of the first eight emperors of the Septim dynasty, beginning with the glorious Tiber Septim, and ending with his great, 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 great grandniece, Kintraya II. Kintraya's murder in Glen Point, while in captivity, is considered by some to be the end of the pure strain of Septim blood in the Imperial family. Certainly, it marks the end of something significant. Uriel III not only proclaimed himself Emperor of Tamriel, but also Uriel Septim III, taking the eminent surname as a title. In truth, his surname was Mantiarco from his father's line. In time, Uriel III was deposed and his crimes reviled, but the tradition of taking the name Septim as a title for the Emperor of Tamriel did not die with him. For six years, the War of the Red Diamond, which takes its name from the Septim family's famous badge, tore the Empire apart. The combatants were the three surviving children of Pelagius II, Potema, Sephorus, and Magnus, and their various offspring. Potema, of course, supported her son, Uriel III, and had the combined support of all of Skyrim and Northern Morrowind. With the efforts of Sephorus and Magnus, however, the province of High Rock turned coat. The provinces of Hammerfell, Somerset Isle, Valenwood, Elsewhere, and Blackmarsh were divided in their loyalty, but most kings supported Sephorus and Magnus. In the Third Era 127, Uriel III was captured in the Battle of Ikadag in Hammerfell. En route to his trial in the Imperial City, a mob overtook his prisoner's carriage and burned him alive within it. His captor and uncle continued on to the Imperial City and by common acclaim was proclaimed Sephorus I, Emperor of Tamriel. Sephorus' reign was marked by nothing but war. By all accounts, he was a kind and intelligent man, but what Tamriel needed was a great warrior, and he, fortunately, was that. It took an additional ten years of constant warfare for him to defeat his sister Potema, the so-called Wolf Queen of Solitude, who died in the siege of her city-state in the year 137. Sephorus survived his sister by only three years. He never had time during the war years to marry, so it was his brother, the fourth child of Pelagius II, who assumed the throne. The Emperor Magnus was already elderly when he took up the imperial diadem, and the business of punishing the traitorous kings of the war of the Red Diamond drained much of his remaining strength. Legend accuses Magnus' son and heir, Pelagius III, of patricide, but that seems highly unlikely, for no other reason than that Pelagius was the king of solitude, following the death of Potema, and seldom he visited the imperial city. 
Pelagius III, sometimes called Pelagius the Mad, was proclaimed emperor in the 145th year of the Third Era. Almost from the start, his eccentricities of behavior were noted at court. He embarrassed dignitaries, offended his vassal kings, and on one occasion marked the end of an imperial grand ball by attempting to hang himself. His long-suffering wife was finally awarded the regency of Tamriel, and Pelagius III was sent to a series of healing institutions and asylums until his death in the Third Era 153rd at the age of 34. The Empress Regent of Tamriel was proclaimed Empress Kataria I upon the death of her husband. Some who do not mark the end of the Septim bloodline with the death of Kentria II consider the ascendancy of this dark elf woman the true mark of its decline. Her defenders, on the other hand, assert that though Kataria was not descended from Tiber, the son she had with Pelagius was, and so the imperial chain did continue. Despite racist assertions to the contrary, Kataria's 46-year reign was one of the most celebrated in Tamriel's history. Uncomfortable in the Imperial City, Kataria traveled extensively throughout the Empire, such as no emperor ever had since Tiber's day. She repaired much of the damage from the previous emperor's broken alliances and bungled diplomacy created. The people of Tamriel came to love their empress far more than nobility did. Kataria's death in a minor skirmish in Black Marsh is a favorite subject of conspiracy-minded historians. The sage Montaleus' discovery, for instance, of a disenfranchised branch of the Septim family and their involvements with a skirmish was a revelation indeed. When Cassinder assumed the throne upon the death of his mother, he was already middle-aged. Only half-elven, he aged like a Breton. In fact, he had left the rule of Wayrest to his half-brother Uriel due to poor health. Nevertheless, as the only true blood relation of Pelagius, and thus Tiber, he was pressed into accepting the throne. To no one's surprise, the Emperor Cassinder's reign did not last long. In two years, he joined his predecessors in eternal slumber. Uriel Lariat, Cassinder's half-brother, and the child of Cataria I and her imperial consort, Galiver Lariat, after the death of Pelagius III, left the kingdom of Wayrest to reign as Uriel IV. Legally, Uriel IV was a septum. Cassinder had adopted him into the royal family when he had become king of Wayrest. Nevertheless, to the council and the people of Tamriel, he was a bastard child of Cataria. Uriel did not possess the dynamism of his mother, and his long 43-year reign was a hotbed of sedition. Uriel the fourth story is told in the third volume of this series. The first volume of this series told, in brief, the story of the succession of the first eight emperors of the Septim dynasty. From Tiber I to Contria II. The second volume described the War of the Red Diamond and the six emperors that followed its aftermath from Uriel III to Cassinder I. At the end of that volume, it was described how the Emperor Cassinder's half brother, Uriel IV, assumed the throne of the Empire of Tamriel. It will be recalled that Uriel IV was not a septum by birth. His mother, though she reigned as empress for many years, was a dark elf married to a true septum emperor, Pelagius III. Uriel's father was actually Cataria I's consort after Pelagius' death, a Breton nobleman named Galiver Lariette. Before taking the throne of empire, Cassinder I had ruled the kingdom of Wayrest, but poor health had forced him to retire. Cassinder had no children, so he legally adopted his half-brother Uriel and abdicated the kingdom. Seven years later, Cassinder inherited the empire at the death of his mother. Three years after that, Uriel once again found himself the recipient of Cassinder's inheritance. 
Uriel IV's reign was a long and difficult one. Despite being a legally adopted member of the Septim family, and despite the Lariat family's high position, indeed, they were the distant cousins of the Septims, few of the Elder Council could be persuaded to accept him fully as a blood descendant of Tiber. The Council had assumed much responsibility during Cataraya I's long reign, and Cassander I's short one, and a strong-willed alien monarch like Uriel IV found it impossible to command their unswearing fealty. Time and again the council and emperor were at odds, and time and again the council won the battles. Since the days of Pelagius II, the elder council had consisted of the wealthiest men and women in the empire, and the power they wielded was conclusive. The council's last victory over Uriel IV was posthumous. Andorak, Uriel IV's son, was disinherited by vote of the council, and a cousin more closely related to the original Septim Lime was proclaimed Sephorus II in the Third Era, 247. For the first nine years of Sephorus II's reign, those loyal to Andorak battled the imperial forces. In an act that the sage Arentine called Tiber Septim's heart beating no more, the council granted Andorak the High Rock Kingdom of Shornhelm to end the war, and Andorak's descendants still rule there. By and large, Sephorus II had foes that demanded more of his attention than Andorak. From out of a Sumerian nightmare, in the words of Arentine, a man who called himself Cameron Usurper led an army of Daedra and undead warriors on a rampage through Valenwood, conquering kingdom after kingdom. Few could resist his onslaughts, and as month turned to bloody month in the year's third era, 249, even fewer tried. Sephorus II sent more and more mercenaries into Hammerfell to stop the usurper's northward march, but they were bribed or slaughtered and raised as undead. The story of Cameron Usurper deserves a book of its own. It is recommended that the reader find Palax Ilthre's The Fall of the Usurper for more detail. In short, however, the destruction of the forces of the Usurper had had little to do with the efforts of the Emperor. The result was a great regional victory and an increase in hostility towards the seemingly inefficacious Empire. Uriel V, Sephorus II's son and successor, swiveled opinion back towards the latent power of the Empire. Turning the attention of Tamriel away from internal strife, Uriel V embarked on a series of invasions beginning almost from the moment he took the throne in the Third Era 268. Uriel V conquered Roscrea in 271, Cathnoque in 276, Inelsia in 279, and Esraniot in 284. In the Third Era 288, he embarked on his most ambitious enterprise, the invasion of the continent kingdom of Akavir. This ultimately proved a failure, for two years later Uriel V was killed in Akavir on the battlefield of Ionith. Nevertheless, Uriel V holds a reputation second only to Tiber as one of the two great warrior emperors of Tamriel. The last four emperors, beginning with Uriel V's infant son, are described in the fourth and final volume of this series. The first book of this series described, in brief, the first eight emperors of the Septim dynasty, beginning with Tiber I. The second volume described the War of the Red Diamond and the six emperors who followed. The third volume described the troubles of the next three emperors, the frustrated Uriel IV, the ineffectual Sephorus II, and the heroic Uriel V. On Uriel V's death across the sea in distant, hostile Akavir, Uriel VI was but five years old. In fact, Uriel VI was born only shortly before his father left for Akavir. Uriel V's only other progeny, by Morganetic alliance, were the twins Morahantha and Elwasa who had been born a month after Uriel V left. Uriel VI was crowned in the 290th year of the Third Era. The Imperial Consort, 
Thanaka, as the boy's mother, was given a restricted regency until Uriel VI reached his majority. The Elder Council retained the real power, as they had ever since the days of Katariah I. The Council so enjoyed its unlimited and unrestricted freedom to promulgate laws and generate profits that Uriel VI was not given full license to rule until 307, when he was already 22 years old. He had been slowly assuming positions of responsibility for years, but the Council and his mother, who enjoyed even her limited regency, were loath to hand over the reins. By the time he came to the throne, the mechanisms of government gave him little power except for that of the imperial veto. This power, however, he regularly and vigorously exercised. By 313, Uriel VI could boast with conviction that he truly did rule Tamriel. He utilized defunct spy networks and guard units to bully and coerce the difficult members of the Elder Council. His half-sister, Morahanta, was not surprisingly his staunchest ally especially after her marriage to the Bariff Ulf Gerson of Winterhold, which brought her considerable wealth and influence. As the sage Ugarij said, Uriel V conquered Esraniot, but Uriel VI conquered the Outer Council. When Uriel VI fell off a horse and could not be resuscitated by the finest imperial healers, his beloved sister Morahanta took up the imperial tiara, at 25 years of age, she had been described by, admittedly self-serving, diplomats as the most beautiful creature in all of Tamriel. She was certainly well-learned, vivacious, athletic, and a well-practiced politician. She brought the Archmagister of Skyrim to the Imperial City and created the second Imperial Battle Mage since the days of Tiber Septim. Morahanta finished the job her brother had begun and made the imperial province a true government under the empress and later the emperor. Outside the imperial province, however, the empire had been slowly disintegrating. Open revolutions and civil wars had raged unchallenged since the days of her grandfather, Sephoris II. Carefully coordinating her counterattacks, Morahanta slowly claimed back her rebellious vassals, always avoiding overextending herself. Though Morahanta's military campaigns were remarkably successful, her deliberate pace often frustrated the council. One councilman, an Argonian who took the Colovian name of Thoricles Romus, furious at her refusal to send troops to his troubled Black Marsh, is commonly believed to have hired the assassins who claimed her life in the Third Era 339. Romus was summarily tried and executed, though he protested his innocence to the last. Morahanta had no surviving children, and Elwasa had died of fever four years before. Elwasa's 25-year-old son, Pelagius, was thus crowned Pelagius IV. Pelagius IV continued his aunt's work, slowly bringing back under his wing the radical and refractory kingdoms, duchies, and baronies of the empire. He exercised Morahanta's poise and circumspect pace in his endeavors, but alas, he did not attain her success. The kingdoms had been free of constraint for so long that even a benign imperial presence was considered odious. Nevertheless, when Pelagius died after a notably stable and prosperous 29-year reign, Tamriel was closer to unity than it had been since the days of Uriel I. Our current emperor, his awesome and terrible majesty, Uriel VII, son of Pelagius IV, has the diligence of his great-aunt Morahanta, the political skill of his great-uncle Uriel VI, and the military prowess of his great-grand-uncle Uriel V. For twenty-one years he reigned and brought justice and order to Tamriel. In the Third Era 389, however, his battle mage, Yegar Tharn, betrayed him. Uriel VII was imposed in a dimension of Tharn's creation, and Tharn used his sorcery of illusion to assume the Emperor's aspect. For the next ten years, Tharn abused Imperial privilege, but did not continue Uriel VII's schedule of reconquest. It is not yet entirely known what Tharn's goals and personal accomplishments were during the ten years he masqueraded as his liege lord. In the Third Era 399, 
an enigmatic champion defeated the battle mage in the dungeon of the Imperial Palace and freed Uriel VII from his other dimensional jail. Since his emancipation, Uriel the Septim VII has worked diligently to renew the battles that would reunite Tamriel. Tharn's interference broke the momentum, it is true, but the years since then have proven that there is hope for the golden age of Tiber Septim's rule glorifying Tamriel once again. <laughs>